The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents International Focus, a weekly discussion of the people and events behind today's global headlines. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now here's your host, Rob Rasigliano. Welcome to International Focus. Today's topic, promoting a green economy. Can government policies aimed at fostering the creation of green jobs make a significant contribution to the U.S. economy? Supporters of a green economic agenda say renewable energy, efficiency, retrofitting, mass transit, and other energy initiatives have the potential to create millions of jobs. They argue that public money is needed to jumpstart innovations that will foster employment and reduce America's dependence on foreign oil. Opponents say these investments are a waste of taxpayer dollars since the businesses cannot compete and succeed without government assistance. To help us explore the role of public investment in green technologies and its potential economic impact, we're joined today by Kate Gordon, Vice President for Energy Policy at the Washington-based Center for American Progress, where her work on the intersection of clean energy and economic development policy has earned national recognition. Kate, welcome to International Focus. Thank you. It's good to be here. So, Kate, I'm wondering um, if you can help we'll start from the, the, the big and work in and, and talk about energy at, at the, the international and national and, and, and state levels. But within the context of the international context, I mean, a lot of people will say, hey, you know, maybe we're late getting on this investment in green jobs and green energy train because the Chinese are doing it, the, you know, Brazil's doing it, India's doing it. Have we, in the international context, have, have we in the United States kind of missed, missed the train? Uh, well, it's definitely happening all over the world. That's absolutely true. The, many countries have figured out that we have, a resource, cons we have resource constraints. We're running out of water. We're running out of fuel. We're running out of, out of um, a number of different resources. And there's a real need to figure out alternatives and, and innovative solutions. Other countries, it's true, have gotten on that train a little earlier than we have. Um, China, everyone knows, I think, is sort of the renewable energy leader of the world in terms of installations. U.S. is, though, the leader of the world in terms of investments in renewable energy, which is interesting. We're still doing a lot of the research and development here. We own a lot of the patents. We're doing a lot of the venture capital investment. And in areas where we have staked out a position, and I would point to alternative vehicles as the big one, we're real world, world leaders. We export that technology. So. Coda Automotive is an electric car company. It's a California company. They do their manufacturing in China. They use American-made, Detroit-made electric drivetrains in their Chinese-made vehicles. So I think that's a great example of sort of when we decide with fuel economy standards, with, with targeted investments, but also with sort of a long history of research development and manufacturing in a particular sector, we really can lead. So when, when we talk, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a blanket term that we hear all the time, either green economy or, or green jobs. Um, can you give us a sense of what, what's the diversity of what we're, what we're yeah. talking about? Right? I mean, you, 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 some people may not even be thinking of, you know, drivetrains or cars. Yeah. When they're thinking maybe about, you know, energy insulation manufacturers or things like that. So I know you, we don't have time to talk about all of it, but could you, if you could sort of help us see the diversity Oh, it's huge. I mean, one of the reasons that it's such an exciting set of industries is because it's so diverse. I mean, you're talking about the kind of classic green stuff, renewable energy, wind, solar, geothermal, biomass, um, hydro, uh, energy efficiency systems, including, you know, efficient refrigerators, um, uh, heating and ventilation systems to clean transportation, to things like land reclamation, brownfield remediation, um, waste to energy, efficient municipal water systems. There's, it's a huge, huge range of things. And I think that it can sometimes be hard to get your head around because it's so many things. But on the other hand, sometimes I sort of think, well, when we talk about you know, high tech, we sort of have an idea in our heads that it's a computer, but it's actually an enormous range of technologies that are sort of, you know, advanced technology systems that are con computer-driven systems. So clean tech is sort of similar. It's a, it's a massive range of technologies. Um, and one, one exciting thing about it is that it's not just a, a big range of technologies. It's a big range of occupations and industries. Any one of the things I just talked about, 
there's potential for job creation from everywhere from research and development to innovation to production to installation to operations and maintenance and then all of the associated service jobs, sales, legal, uh, administrative, accounting, all of that. So really giant range of jobs. Well, I mean, sometimes people, again, are thinking about the jobs being in um, the very sort of high-end, maybe technological yeah. research and development. So unless you're a PhD in some math or engineering related discipline, you're kind of out of that. And of course, a lot is made of the US education system is not really producing, being strong in science and, and, and uh, engineering. Um, uh, so the, the jobs, just go, you, start, you alluded to this, but so yeah. where are the jobs, basically? Is it just yeah. for those people that have those, the high-level training in science and, and, and engineering, or right. is it broader? It's, it's not at all just for those people. I mean, it, again, it depends on which piece of the industry you're talking about. So let's take, um, well, renewable energy and efficiency. There certainly are jobs in innovation, just like anything. I mean, there are jobs at research labs, at big universities like this one. There's jobs in the sort of early-stage innovation. But the majority of the jobs actually, interestingly, are um, what we call middle skill jobs. They're jobs that are available to people primarily with technical degrees, not necessarily with a four-year college degree or an advanced um, academic degree, but with uh, two-year engineering degrees, um, with particular types of technical skills like for manufacturing. We, uh, we actually know from a study Brook the Brookings Institute did recently that 26% of the jobs in the broad range of the clean energy economy will be in manufacturing, which is a very large number for a sort of a new developing industry. Compare that to something like healthcare. Healthcare, you're going to get a, a, a kind of a small number of jobs in innovation and research and a huge number of service sector jobs. That's mostly what the healthcare industry looks like. Um, biotech, you also get, you know, you get the research and development jobs, then you get a lot of sort of sales um, uh, and related medical jobs. This is a sector where you have a lot of manufacturing, a lot of construction, a lot of operation and maintenance. So those are increasingly sort of your middle skill, middle, middle class kind of two-year degree, technical degree type jobs. That does not mean they're not skilled jobs, though. Um, one thing we're really finding in the energy sector is a real labor shortage um, in technically skilled middle skill workers. So the, the, the um, utility industry, for instance, ha is uh, looking at retirements of about 40% of its workforce in the next 10 years. They are really struggling to find people who are coming out of high school who have the and able to go into those technical programs and come out with the skills that they need. So that's going to be a real issue for us. So, I mean, I know you, you, you're a strong advocate of, of sort of the public investment in, yeah. in the green job sector. I'm, 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 I'm guessing that we're, part of what your advocacy is based on is that, that uh, if you look at the different sectors you could be, uh, the government could be trying to support that, yeah. that um, green jobs and the green economy is one that actually has a, is a better investment because the kinds of jobs it creates. I mean, is it because it's creating both the high skill technical jobs but also these middle skill uh, jobs as uh, manufacturing as well as, as sort of R&D type jobs. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a reason. Um, you, you know, I certainly would not argue that wherever you have a, a, a potential for good jobs, you should do government investment. I yeah. think there's, uh, green economy really kind of is, is at the intersection of a lot of places where government investment makes sense historically. Um, we tend to invest where there's a market failure, so where private business won't pick up the slack. This is definitely one of those areas. We have 100 years of infrastructure for the fossil fuel economy. We have built all that stuff out. We already have the wells. We already have the utility systems. We have the transmission grids. We haven't built out any of the clean economy stuff. When we built out the fossil fuel economy, it was with government subsidy. The oil and gas industry has been subsidized since early, since, the, since uh, I think 1904, were the first production subsidies, and it continued throughout. Um, uh, coal extraction has been subsidized throughout. So that, so that stuff is both built out and it was subsidized. Um, so you have a market failure there. It's hard to come in as a new entrant to that market. So these are emerging technologies. We need to give them a boost. Um, we also don't capture the extern external costs of those industries. So coal, um, huge health costs uh, in terms of asthma cases, lung cancer cases in the United States. We don't capture those costs in the cost of, of energy production. So 
Therefore, coal looks like it's much cheaper than renewable energy because we don't capture the costs. Another market failure. And then to your back to your point, there's we have a public interest in promoting gr green energy. So we often do government investment where we think that the market isn't taking care of something that we need to deal with for the long-term interest of the public, not the quarterly business cycle, but like 15, 20, 50 years out. This is definitely one of those cases. I mean, this here we're talking about the difference between low carbon technologies that are sort of helpful with the, with reversing global warming and high carbon technologies that are continuing to exacerbate it. So there's so many different reasons why government investment for a period of time makes sense here. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just think of it as like a co-benefit that you also have a lot of industries and occupations and rebuild the middle class. <laughs> that seems like a good thing. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so the, getting back, kind of looking at some of the uh, the, this, the the development of this economy in the global perspective. And so, yeah. so again, some may argue that yes, maybe we we have some market failures here in the U.S. But are we susceptible to international players coming in and filling those gaps as opposed to you know filling them from within, basically through through yeah. through government? Government subsidy, and, and I, I know um, uh, you know Solyndra is, is in a lot of ways held up as a, a, a failure of, of government investment, largely because Solyndra is one of these industries that they're saying a solar yeah. panel producer that couldn't compete. Right. So that you had say the Chinese or whoever else coming in and under undercutting them. Um, we've got just a couple minutes before our, our, our break. So could you talk a little bit about how what's the potential for international players coming in? Yeah. And, and filling those gaps or, or those market failures as opposed to doing it? Yeah, no, I mean, I think there's, there's sort of two different things going on. Um, until we have sort of a national commitment to moving to a greener energy system, to pricing carbon, to trying to do something about global warming, um, it's going to be hard for there to be a large-scale market here for any of this stuff because in order to manufacture products, you have to know that there's going to be demand for them long enough out to build a plant and then to have stuff on your factory floor. So we have a little bit of a problem with that. Um, but in the places where we do see the demand, for instance, in places like Texas that has a great renewable energy standard, you know, 30 states have those now, we are seeing a lot of foreign direct investment, actually. China is coming in and, and doing the manufacturing and assembly and trying to fill that gap a little bit. Um, I mean, I think that's, you know, as long as you're creating jobs here, I don't have an issue with sort of who owns the company. But, um, but certainly in other countries, what we're seeing is a much stronger kind of domestic focus in building up domestic manufacturing and building up domestic demand. Uh, uh, and and sort of more more certainty, honestly, just more certainty that that those those technologies will be bought and sold and and, and manufactured. So you mentioned um, Texas having the standard, and that, that, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, so if we look, if we sort of turn more to looking at what's happening nationally, and then ultimately to what's happening in Wisconsin, um, if you could give us a, a, a brief overview before a break about yeah. how um, how the states have approached this issue yep. for, at a sta at a state level. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I think in the United States in general, when we think about economic development, we do it very differently at the federal level and the state level. At the state level, what you see is, um, you know, frankly, what in Washington people would call picking winners and losers. What we do at the state level is we say, you know, let's look at a state like Wisconsin. Where are our strengths? What do we have? What can we leverage? What do we already have historic um, competitiveness in? What types of businesses do we not want to lose? Do we want to kind of keep here? And, you, and states will take a look at that and then think about policies that sort of work for that. So you see um, 30 states have renewable energy standards now requiring a percent of their power to come from renewable sources. Many states have carved out specific technologies there. So in the southwest, you see solar getting a lot of attention there because they've got a lot of sun, right? right, right. Um, states in the Midwest have tended to include more manufacturing policies as part of their energy policies, Wisconsin. Uh, Governor Doyle used some of the state energy program money from the Recovery Act to go to manufacturers. That was the, we were the only state that did that. Um, so the, you, you definitely see more of a sort of an economic development perspective and sort of a leveraging of strengths perspective. Right. In Europe, you see that at the country level, and then the EU sort of takes the bigger overarching approach. Um, well, actually, we'll, we'll, we'll come down talking more specifically about Absolutely. Wisconsin after our break. So uh, to our viewers, we'll be back in just a moment on International Focus. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu.
Welcome back to International Focus. We're talking about promoting a green economy with Kate Gordon of the Center for American Progress. Um, um, Kate, j so just before the break, we, we, you gave us a kind of a quick overview of how states tend to approach yep. uh, this issue, and, and we, you made some references back to Wisconsin. So I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about, about how this all boils down. So now we have you know, this international environment, we have the national environment. How does it, how does it play out for us here in Wisconsin? Well, it's interesting. Um, Wisconsin ha had been in somewhat of a leadership position, actually. Um, there, there were a couple state efforts around biomass in particular. So Wisconsin... Can you talk a little bit about what, what we yeah, mean Yeah, I will, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Wisconsin is a... It's, I always sort of laugh at this because it's, it's, you know, it's not as sexy as wind and solar, but it's, what Wisconsin has a lot of is, um, is agricultural waste, forestry waste, municipal waste. I mean, everyone has that. Um, but, but because of the combination of agriculture and forestry in the state, which is a pretty unusual that both of them are still as prevalent as they are, uh, you get a lot of sort of waste wood, waste agricultural products. That can be used in a number of different energy applications. So it can be used for biofuels. Um, it can be used for cogeneration, so bur essentially burning in coal plants to, to displace some of the coal. Um, you can use the I mean, things like manure um, for anaerobic Which digestion. Have, we have some here. A lot of manure in Wisconsin. Yeah, um, you can uh, you can turn that into energy, uh, especially at the kind of farm level scale or community scale. Mm -hmm. So uh, Wisconsin was actually sort of a leader on figuring out how to use all this biomass um, and waste product and turn it into energy and sort of be a leader and sort of innovate on that. Um, that's still happening a little bit. There's a center at University of Wisconsin Madison that I think is being built partly for that purpose. Um, the current governor has not been quite as focused on those strategies as Governor Doyle was before. Um, what you're seeing now, which is a little bit, um, which is, I think, taking the state backward, is is sort of a retraction from a number of these policies, I think, for partisan reasons. I mean, clean energy has gotten sort of a partisan flavor in Washington and in a lot of the states. And so Governor Walker has backed away from some of the wind s turbine siting rules that would have made it easier to put up turbines here, backed away from some of the biomass um, applications like the transformation of the Madison plant from coal to biomass, backed away from some of the incentives to get like pulp and paper mills to switch to doing wood pellets and things like that. So in, in, in some ways it feels like Wisconsin has really stepped away from taking that economic development model I was talking about before the break and, and sort of instead said, let's go back to our old way of doing things. Let's figure out what we can extract and where we can send it. Um, and you really see that with the silica sand. Um, Wisconsin is a big producer of the sand that's used in natural gas fracking. So Wisconsin doesn't have the natural gas, but it sends the sand to the states that do have the natural gas, and then Wisconsin imports the natural gas back in order to make its energy. And you know, I would argue, let's look in the state for economic potential and jobs for actually displacing some of that imported energy instead of having this sort of extraction and export model. Well, so then, I mean, the, the sort of energy model uh, you, is is a pretty sounds like a pretty fundamental shift. In other words, yeah. uh, what's our vision for the the kind of economic model we're going to have here? And That's energy right. being a, such a big part of of any economy. Um, what, so if if we're not looking at the the existing model, the old model, what's, yeah. the, what's the new model? Well, no, I think you're right. I mean, I think we are really at a, a, a kind of a crossroads here. Um, there, there's an actual alternative model. There's a model being put out there by the American Petroleum Institute um, that's become kind of gotten picked up by a number of candidates for president, for instance, that really says where we want America to go is domestic production of everything, So, but everything in fossil fuels. We want to drill offshore, we want to drill onshore, we want to drill in Anwar in Alaska, we want to do the Keystone Pipeline and we want to do all the natural gas production we can. That's a very sort of, it's kind of like a gold rush model of, of economic growth. And then the alternative- the theory being, yeah. part of the theory being by shifting to dom domestic production of those right. fuels that it, it lessens our reliance on sure. the Middle East or on um, uh, imports from right. other countries. Yeah. Right. No. Absolutely. But but in, but but in, but only going so far as to say so. Let's get all the fossil fuels. Let's extract as much as we can. Whereas I think there's an alternative that's equally about be, getting rid of dependence on the Middle East and and dependence on fossil fuels. That says okay, instead of that, let's do some of those things. Let's continue to you know sort of see what's going on with natural gas. Think about that as a resource. Um, displace coal if possible. But let's also look at some of these renewable resources. Let's think about not just utility-scale giant power systems, but let's think about household-scale or community-scale systems. 
let's um, let's give people let's think about saving oil and energy instead of just figuring out different places to get it from. Um, to me, that's much more about giving uh, individual consumers choices. So you're sort of saying to someone, you know, today, the five big oil companies that just made record profits in 2011 um, because gas prices were high, uh, they tell you what kind of oil you can, gas you can put in your car. Tomorrow, let's figure out a system where if that price gets too high, you have a choice. You have an alternative. Mm -hmm. You have something else you can do. You can do biodiesel at a community station. You can drive a different kind of car. You can take transit instead of driving a car. You have those choices. So to me, it's really that, uh, I mean, besides the environmental aspect, there's really a choice here between kind of a very consolidated top-down model of energy and one that's much more distributed and diversified with just many, many more choices. It, it, but it is part of the reluctance to, to kind, of, kind of want to get into the green economy and certainly to, to support public investment in the green economy, a feeling that we can't do this. I mean, so, so where would be the... Where would be the drivers of this? I mean, you mentioned yeah. part of, of government's role, and perhaps if you want to say more about what it is that government could do to get us there. Yeah. Um, but what are the other drive? Could be the other drivers of the making this sh shift? Because I think part of people's feeling is if it's only government. Yeah. Um, or if it's only the you know federal government subsidies or even state government subsidies that that we can't do that. Right. And well, I mean, I think first it's important to make clear that it's definitely not only government. So Solyndra, you brought up earlier, is a great example. Solyndra you know, solar company, solar manufacturing company um, was, one of the things about Solyndra was that it was trying to capture a specific niche in the market um, and taking a big risk by doing it. But it was basically saying, because the price of silicon at the time was so high, we're going to invent a way to do solar that uses less silicon. Now, unfortunately, the silicon market collapsed right after that. So um, they didn't necessarily ex ex expect that to happen. But um, but Solyndra was such a good business model that, you know, the, the U.S. government put money into it, but the private sector put in far more money than the U.S. government did. The U.S. doing a loan guarantee there um, essentially, you know, helped leverage a whole lot of private money. And that's basically what you see with these public investments is that what they generally do is that the government sends some kind of a signal, in this case a signal that we as a nation were interested in these sort of innovative new approaches on renewables. And then you get a lot of private sector investment as a result. You see that over and over and over again. Um, China has done uh, a range of policies to, to support uh, renewable energy, including sort of high level five year plan, we like renewable energy, all the way down to specific investments and subsidies. Um, China is now, Ernst & Young has rated China the single best country for private investment, to, to attract private investment in the world right. because of those suite of policies that sort of indicate that the country is moving in that direction and that there'll be demand. So this so. is more like, so, so uh, as opposed to the, the government being the, 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 in the limelight of the prime mover yeah. in this shift, it's, you're really saying it's private sector. Uh, oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean the government can play it. The government doesn't, I mean, the government has, you know, what the government has to give to any sector is a drop in the bucket compared to the private sector. The private sector is the financer and the job creator, mm -hmm. always, mm -hmm. right? So what the government can do is really just sort of signal that the risk of a new sector is a little bit lower than it would be with no, with no sort of government signal at all. So I think that's important. Um, uh, and I think you can send that signal to the private sector in a number of different ways. We you know, it, do, it doesn't have to be sort of an act of Congress. Right now we're seeing the Defense Department, the nation's single largest user of energy, mm -hmm. sending that signal to the private sector by saying, look, we want all of our bases to be zero energy. Mm -hmm. um, we want to go on microgrids, so if there's an attack on the transmission grid, our bases won't have a blackout. We want to put solar panels on Air Force hangars because they're big, unused real estate. They're doing all kinds of interesting stuff. By doing that, they're both actually creating a market for these technologies, and they're sending a signal that, that there will be a demand within the United States for these technologies, and that's huge. I mean, that will change the market. We've got just a couple minutes left, and I want to yeah. give you your, your final exam question, which is, uh, so if you were... Uh, contracted by both the committee to re-elect President Obama and the committee to elect the, whoever the eventual Republican challenger is, what, what's the single or couple pieces of advice you're going to whisper in their ear about how to, how to take advantage of this issue? Well, you know, we are living in a tough deficit time, and it's not a good moment to sort of say we need, I mean, as I used to in my previous job, we needed an Apollo program for energy. I think we do. It's not a great time to sort of talk about massive public investment. What we could do, though, is something every other country has done, which is to send some kind of a signal that we actually want to see a transformation in our energy system. So probably the first thing I would recommend, and it's something that various people have talked about, but no one has really done seriously, is some kind of a clean energy standard. 
we want some percent of the energy in the country to come from low carbon sources. Not a technology specific standard. We're not telling each part of the country how to reach that. But we're sort of doing what Europe has done. The European Union has said, we want to get to 20% renewables, 20% more efficiency, and 20% lower carbon by 2020. Countries figure out how to do it. Mm. We need to do the same thing here because otherwise, we're essentially saying, sending a signal that we are out of the clean energy race. We don't want to participate. We want to keep kind of going on the same fossil fuel model. And ultimately, we're going to run out of resources and we're going to have to buy from other countries to meet, to meet our long-term demand. Great. Uh, so, Kate, thank you very much thank for, for uh, again, breaking down a very complicated issue uh, as we went from the international down to the <laughs> to the local level, which I know is not always easy. Um, if people are, uh, your program, um, the Energy Policy Program at the Center for American Progress, yep. a place people can go for resources if they want to find out more about this. Yep. It's AmericanProgress.org. We're very easy to find. Great. So. Great. So, Kate Gordon, uh, Center for American Progress, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, to our viewers, we'll see you next week on International Focus. For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220, or visit us at our website, 